in the early years of peripheral arterial disease, or sort of, I, I consider it the coronary years, uh, the angioplasty years of coronary and uh, revascularization. So we're still getting the data, and this is very, very important. As a cardiologist, we know uh, evidence-based medicine is very important. We just haven't had that data yet. And so uh, these speakers will hopefully be able to sed shed some light on that and um, help treat our patients in a better way. John? Good afternoon. Um, my name is John Winscott. I'm an interventional cardiologist um, from Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, in Mississippi, everything we do re uh, revolves around food. And so I'm very comfortable speaking to you while you eat. So please feel free to do that. Um, what we're going to try to do today, there have been great discussions this morning about the treatment of peripheral disease. And, and uh, several comments have been made about there are a lot of different ways to skin a cat. And so what we're going to do is show you a lot of different ways um, to treat peripheral arterial disease and show you some of the evidence that we have behind what we do. And so what we're going to do is show, uh, I'm going to begin by showing you some novel approaches that you can use to cross chronic total occlusions. Dr. Krishna is going to talk to you about the definitive LE data. And uh, the definitive LE is uh, the largest trial we have so far for atherectomy in the periphery. Very good data set, and he's going to talk to you the details about that. And then John George is going to talk to you about the durability 2 trial and the use of stents uh, in the SFA popliteal segment. So like I said, I'm going to introduce you to the uh, veons and interior catheters and talk to you about some novel approaches uh, to cross uh, CTOs. Um, as you know, uh, as you've seen already today, and it's been a good segue looking at the last couple of talks, and especially the live case with the occluded uh, popliteal vessel that can be really difficult to cross. Um, if you treat peripheral arterial disease, you're going to treat CTO. So different than coronary disease where there are a few operators that kind of specialize in CTO in coronaries, but most interventional cardiologists don't really tr cross that many CTOs in the coronaries. In contrast to that, in the periphery, you're really going to, you're going to encounter CTOs on a daily basis. And if you do critical limb ischemia, as I spend about 75 to 80 percent of my life doing, you're going to be crossing multi-level CTOs. They're very common infrainguinally, especially in patients with critical limb. Um, half of patients that present to you with symptomatic claudication, SFA disease, are going to be CTOs. Very common in critical limb. Multi-level CTOs are very common. And if you're going to be an endovascular specialist that takes care of patients, especially CLI, you have to be able to cross CTOs. If you can't cross, you can't treat. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today is different ways to add to your toolbox to cross these chronic total occlusions. They can also cause complications. And up to 15% of complications that you see in treating CTOs are just from crossing itself. And we'll talk about some of the unique things you can do to try to avoid that. These fibrous caps, the calcific caps in the proximal vessel are very difficult. That can often be a little easier from the retrograde approach, and that was discussed in the live case that we just completed. Um, but there can be really a lot of difficulty crossing these in the lumen and trying to get in back into the true lumen distally. You're trying to avoid side branches. You saw in that popliteal case, there was a large geniculate collateral off that uh, popliteal that made it very difficult to stay in the vessel. These are often long segment. We're just talking about vibons, treating these long segment disease. It's not uncommon to see three and 400 millimeter occlusions in the SFA popliteal segment uh, that can be very difficult to cross. And you want a device that you can use that gives you a lot of options, a lot of flexibility, especially for anti-grade and retrograde. So that's what I'm going to talk to you more about today. We've talked a lot this morning about the histology of a total occlusion, how the patient presents to you clinically. If they come in with a couple years of claudication, they come in with two days of a cold leg. It's a lot different when you look at an occluded vessel as to how the patient presented. But all of these vessels have very complex histology. There's organized thrombus. Some of them may have some acute thrombus. There's various amounts of calcium. But the thing I want you to concentrate today on for this talk is the presence of microchannels and the ability to use those microchannels to help you get started in the vessel at the proximal cap and then to stay in the vessel as you approach uh, the distal cap. So I talked this morning a little bit about um, setting yourself to, up for success and crossing CTOs in the tibials and I'm a big believer in setting yourself up and just trying to put, put everything in your favor that you can. Um, and I won't review all this, I talked about this this morning, but 
those of you who aren't here, you just want to take a full set of angios all the way to the foot. Make sure you know what your options are for both anti-grade and retrograde. Look for delayed filling of those pedal vessels. Um, you may need to inject directly into a collateral to define the inflow um, and look for that collateral filling of the distal vessel to see where your target is you're trying to cross to. Uh, define the inflow and the outflow of the CTO and identify the target you really wanted to reach, especially if it's a wound patient you really wanted to get straight line flow to the angiosome of that wound. Go ahead and commit early. Get a, get a supportive sheath in that's going to give you the support you need for crossing these CTOs. I'm a big believer in taking a support catheter to the proximal cap of the CTO and injecting directly onto that proximal cap and looking for those micro channels that you can get a wire or catheter started in. I'm going to show you an example of that in just a minute. Choose a crossing strategy, and then if that's not working, change. Escalate early. We're just looking at a live case where they were trying to get through that popliteal occlusion. Um, hopefully we'll hear the result of that later, but I guarantee you if they come with that, that retrograde, they're probably going to cross in about five minutes. Um, so, you know, if, you're not, if what you're doing is not working, the 50th time you push the wire in the same direction, the same wire, the same plane, it's probably not going to go in. Change and do something different. This is just a great example to me of a very complex proximal cap and an SFA occlusion and why I think it's really important to deliberately choose where you engage the cap. If you look at this SFA, it's not that long of an occlusion, but this cap is very complex. And if you just blindly push a stiff hydrophilic glide wire down this vessel, it's probably going to go down the lateral side, get in a subintimal plane, and you're not going to be able to be in the vessel distally without some type of reentry technique. However, if you see this little spot right here on the distal cap and as I mag, on the proximal cap, as I mag up, you can see right there, there's a nice soft spot in the proximal cap. And after pushing a wire there for about five seconds, we got through the, through the lumen, intralumen, through the vessel intraluminally, treated it with directional atherectomy, and you see we got a nice stent-like result um, with just directional atherectomy in this vessel. I doubt you would have gotten this nice of a result if we had to use a subintimal technique. So the Veyance crossing catheter is one of those ways you can stay in the vessel. Um, it's a novel technique. Um, it's a very low profile device. It's only 037, so it doesn't put any larger hole in a vessel than an 035 wire really, um, if you were to exit the vessel, cause a perforation. It has this torquing handle. It's basically just a modified torque. allows you to spin the device and use orthogonal displacement of friction to allow you to penetrate the proximal cap and get through the vessel in the lumen. It does, has a wire lumen in it that takes an 01, any 014 wire, so you can use the 014 wire of your choice to basically choose exactly how aggressive you want to be to stiffen the catheter. This is how it works. You can see as the catheter engages the proximal cap, it's really important, I think, to deliberately choose where you engage the proximal cap with this catheter, like I showed you on the previous slide. But as you spin the catheter, it will just try to find that weak spot in the proximal cap, and then it will use these micro channels to course through the CTO and then hopefully deliver you into the distal vessel in the lumen. And as you deliver it into the distal vessel, then you just advance your wire that you had inside the vessel, I mean inside the catheter. When I first started using this catheter, I tend to use more crossing wires, stiffer wires like Miracle Brothers 4, 5, or, you know, 4 or 6 or uh, those type wires. What I've learned after using, doing a lot of cases, it's better to use a more flexible wire and just allow the catheter to work. If you put a stiffer wire through this catheter, it tends to take away the advantage of trying to find those microchannels. This is an example um, of a Viance used from the foot, courtesy of Dr. Mustafa. And you can see on ultrasound, you can see the catheter actually coursing through the vessel here and staying in the lumen. Um, so I just thought this was a really unique video of watching the catheter work as it comes up to the vessel using ultrasound. Like I said, this vessel works by finding microchannels in the CTO, and it really works well. If you can get it started in the vessel, deliberately choosing where you engage that proximal cap, you can get it through the occlusion. If you do get to the distal vessel and you're not in the lumen, and you're talking about trying to use reentry techniques, of course you can try to redirect a wire, try to get back in to the true lumen that way. But if you can't get in the true lumen, then you're left with you trying to use a reentry device. The three on the market right now are Pioneer, Outback, and then the Interior, which I'm going to introduce to you now, uh, which for those of you who do coronary CTO, this is very similar to the Stingray balloon. But it's a flat balloon that has two exit ports for a wire that are 180 degrees apart. And so you basically get the balloon to the distal vessel, inflate the balloon, and then choose the port in the balloon that allows you to exit the catheter into the, toward the true lumen. The wire comes in three different 
uh, strengths, uh, flexible, a standard, and a stiff. I use a standard on about 98% of cases that I use this catheter. It works very well if you're somewhere in the ballpark of the distal vessel. The way this works is you advance it through the subintimal space down to where your target is. You inflate the balloon and it sits flat in the subintimal space. And then I rotate the camera to where I look like I'm the furthest away from the vessel and that tells me where the direction I need to poke the wire. When you get the wire down to the distal vessel, you're able to angle the tip toward the lumen. So here, obviously, this is not the port we want. We want the other port. And so we angle the wire other, the other direction. We engage the intima, and then with a stabbing motion, you pop into the distal vessel. After you do that, you turn the wire 180 degrees to keep it from digging into the opposite wall, and then advance it down in the vessel. After that, you can use whatever catheter you'd like to exchange, a 014 balloon, whatever you'd like to do to exchange for a more friendly wire, and then you just treat the vessel as you would normally. For me, that's almost always directional atherectomy. So this is a case where we um, used an interior. We got down to the distal SFA occlusion. We were subintimal, could not direct the wire back into the lumen. So we used an interior balloon here. You can see we directed the wire back into the true lumen. The use of this catheter marries really well with directional atherectomy because you, you know where you were subintimal. You know where the true lumen is. And so you can use directional atherectomy to shave out the flap that's created by the subintimal dissection. And then you can see this is the spot where we entered. It looks like a stent-like result, and that's just an atherectomy only result. So these, this catheter uh, married with directional atherectomy works really well if you're committed to not putting in stents. So um, just some points. You know, I like to use the, the standard wire. Um, once it exits the, the distal port, you want to I mean, once you engage the port, you want to make a stabbing motion that enters the, the distal lumen. Once you get there, you want to rotate the wire so you don't dig into the opposite wall. Confer your true lumen with both fluoroscopy and just the feel of the wire that's not in the subintimal space. Um, and then, of course, I exchange for a friendlier wire as soon as possible. Just a couple quick cases. This is a patient um, that was in a really bad uh, situation where he had a occluded common femoral artery, was not a very good surgical candidate due to severe cardiac disease. Um, you can see it, he's occluded the femoral head's about right here, so it's really an external iliac, distal lateral iliac occlusion. Um, however, he had this lake of dye that showed up in the mid SFA. The profunda was completely occluded and did not reconstitute. So, what we did was we directly accessed the SFA through the mid thigh and introduced an 035 trailblazer up to the proximal cap and then introduced a Veonce crossing catheter through the trailblazer catheter, which is just an example of how. how uh, um, how the different ways you can use this catheter. It's very um, flexible. So you can see after using the 035 trailer special cat, we're able to advance the Viance up through the common femoral occlusion. And then once we got the wire up into the true lumen, we're able to treat the, we snared the wire, externalized, pulled out the quick cross out of the, out of the SFA, and then treated the common femoral directional atherectomy. And this is our result. We now have straight line flow into the SFA. He also had a popliteal occlusion that we had to crop structure grade, ended up with straight line flow to the foot and he was able to heal the wound. This is a case very similar to the case you just saw live of a popliteal occlusion with a large geniculate collateral. Um, very difficult to cross this uh, because everything wants to go into the geniculate and it's really hard to stay inside the, the lumen. And so after failed attempts to cross this, cross this anagrade, um, unfortunately he only had a perineal for runoff. Um, so what we like to do is access the perineal above the ankle and so once we access the perineal here above the ankle, we brought a veance up, but again, we were subintimal at the proximal cap. And so we placed a four French sheath in the perineal vessel. The, the package insert says five French, but I'll tell you off label that you can insert the interior through a four French sheath. So we put a four French sheath in the perineal and brought the interior up from the perineal access. And you can see this is the inverted interior. And you can see we pop into the true lumen rotate the wire, go up, we snared the wire, and then treated the popliteal anagrade. And after directional atherectomy, you see we've got a nice result with brisk flow into the perineal. This patient actually healed his wound as well. So that's just an introduction to the Viance and interior and just some novel ways you can use to treat CTOs, cross CTOs, and then treat CTOs. They're very easy concepts to use. There's no capital equipment. You just put them on your shelf and, shelf and use them when you need them. And, uh, you know, crossing a CTO may be the difference in uh, a successful case, patient, saving that patient's limb or amputation. So that being said, um, I'm a big believer in directional atherectomy. I cross all my CTOs 
as atraumatically as possible so I can do directional atherectomy and get a standalone atherectomy result. And I based on that, based on the definitive LE data that we're fixing to hear. Well, um, I'm just going to continue on here and for the sake of time. But um, as you heard earlier, you know, there is a sparsity of data in, um, in what we do, as Dr. Walker pointed out, in certain areas. But, you know, there, there used to be a group of hawkers and non-hawkers and et cetera, et cetera. I was always a hawker. But I think it's exciting that we have some data to talk about. And I think we have a lot of data that uh, proved what we feel was right, was truly right. So this is a directional atherectomy and an effective treatment option for improper lesions in patients with critical limb ischemia. So, so the definitive LE uh, study design is, is really um, a kind of revolutionary in terms that it was one of the largest registries ever, ever done with atherectomy for sure. So the primary objective with the PIs of good friends of ours, um, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim McKenzie, excuse me, and, and Larry Garcia, Jim will kill me, um, to evaluate the intermediate and long-term effectiveness of standalone Silverhawk or Turbohawk peripheral plaque exertion systems for endovascular treatment of PAD in the pop ephemeral popliteal and infrapopliteal arteries. So it, it, it was very specific because you had a pre-specified pre diabetic versus non-diabetic patent, patency analysis, prospective, non-randomized, it was a global study, it was co-lab adjudicated, you had a steering committee oversight, and you had 800 patients at 47 different centers, and you had angiographic and duplex collab. So clearly a real-world uh, kind of study that I think all of us uh, you know, take care of these very difficult patients, as you've seen in the live cases today. So the, the eligibility criteria were, very, were again, very real word. Rutherford, uh, uh, Becker, uh, 1 to 6, greater than 50% stenosis, lesion length less than 20, reference vessel diameter greater than 1.5, less than 7. And the exclusion criteria were severe clock calcification because that had already been studied in a, in a different atherectomy study, instant re because it's an off-label use, and anywhere you have aneurysms. And this is just an example of your study design. You had 800 patients and you had 598 claudicans and 201 CLI patients. And, you, and again, the endpoints for the claudicans arm was primary uh, patency by duplex at 12 months. And in the CLI arm, which I'm going to focus on, was freedom from major unplanned amputation at 12 months. Again, very, very hard and reproducible endpoints. So if you look at the, the characteristics of the lesions, you can see that the infrapopliteal cohort um, uh, it was, around, was around 34% or 96 patients in the CLI arm. And if you look at Rutherford classification, again, real world, you know, four or five, mostly four and fives with some sixes. I also want you to look at the, 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 the uh, you know, the expected dominance of diabetics in the infrapopliteal and also the high use of, uh, you know, um, hypertensive and renal insufficiency patients as well. So if you look at the baseline uh, lesion characteristics, which I think are important because it kind of directs you and to see how real world this trial really is, you've got 33% you've got occlusions, uh, calcific lesions, 31.3%, although not severe calcific. And, and if you look at the lesion lengths, also very much very real world in terms of what, what we really face in the infrapopliteal segments. So again, occlusions and calcifications. You can see when you compare with the claudicans versus the infrapopliteal lesions, the occlusions were obviously more in the, in the, in the, uh, in the CLI uh, cohort, uh, and as was the calcification, which I think all of us who do these cases know that this is true. If you look at the complications of the procedure, they were very, very low. Distal embolization was only 4.3%. Uh, requiring treatment was even less. Uh, dissections, zero, and perforations, extremely, extremely low. So again, when this is it reflecting the safety of the device in, a, in a 47 different centers in a worldwide approach. So this way, this, no matter, not only the most experienced operator can use it, but also, obviously, somebody who's, who's relatively new or just starting out with atherectomy. But the outcomes were really not surprising to those of us who, who, who've used it for, since the beginning. And I can pretty much uh, you know, say that with confidence because I know all the guys who use a lot of this. Uh, you know, complete wound healing was, uh, was, was very good at 68%. But if you look at limb salvage late rates was 94%. Again, phenomenal, phenomenal result. Freedom from TLR in the, in the CLI infrapopliteal cohort was 87%. So again, incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, very satisfying results. And the primary patency uh, was 78% in this trial. 
So if you compare the intrapopteal lesions to the Claudican cohort, obviously limb salvage was, and you would expect it to be a little bit better in, in, the, in the Claudican cohort. But if you look at freedom from TLR and the primary patency, they were, they were very, very good in, in, in both the arms. If, if you look at this, the, the subgroup patency, you can see here, oops, I'm so sorry, how do I go back? Uh, can you go back one slide, please? Okay, if you look at the subgroup KMC, whether you're a diabetic or a non-diabetic, and this is, I, I guess, uh, you know, all, the early hawkers would always say, hey, we've got the great results in diabetic or non-diabetic um, arms, and did this really prove to be true in the, in the subgroup analysis? Uh, as you can see, the patencies in the diabetic and non-diabetic cohorts were, were actually very, very similar. So when you compare it to alternative therapies that are out there, I mean, you, we looked at the definitive LE uh, data and compared it to different meta-analysis of uh, PTA bypass, DCB, and PTA, and you can see it's a very, very comparable and competes very well with, with the other data that's out there with about a 12-month primary patency rate of around 78%. The 12-month freedom from TLR is, is, is much higher in the definitive LE at 87%. But again, if you compare it to, to DCB, it's around the same ballpark, around 82%. Limb salvage rates, again, very, very good in, in definitive LE, as I just went over, and very, very comparable to, to the BMS, the PTA arm, the bypass, bypass, the DCB, or the PTA. So in conclusion, you know, directional atherectomy is an effective uh, treatment option for infrapopteal disease in CLI patients, and Definitive LE clearly demonstrated the following. First and foremost, it is an extremely safe therapy in, in basically very, very small learning curve if for any, anyone to try. As you can see by the, the, the low embolization rates, the low dissection rates, and, 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 the, and the, I think, the non-existent perforation rates. Second, you're able to achieve what you want to achieve in CLI patients, which is complete wound healing and limb salvage. That's very, very clearly demonstrated with, with, with a 68% complete wound healing rates. And those of you who know uh, CLI trials, nobody really reports complete wound healing rates. They always report uh, about, you know, limb salvage rates. But if you look at limb salvage rates, it's also 94%. Freedom from TLR, 87%, and a primary patency at 78%. I thank you for your attention. All right, good afternoon. I'm going to keep, uh, keep on. And uh, my topic for today is uh, talking about scaffolding. So you heard uh, a variety of talks here, uh, starting with uh, CTO crossing, then uh, atherectomy. And then there are those cases where you need the scaffolding or the support of a stent, and, and that's what we'll talk about in this next session. So what do we know? We talked about the paucity of data in, in the peripheral arterial space and, and what we don't have uh, compared to you know, the coronary space, for example. And uh, looking at uh, data in, in stents, uh, this is what we have. Uh, so this is a chart. I'm not sure how well it portrays for you. Um, but this is looking at 12-month, 24-month, and 36-month data follow-up uh, after stenting uh, in patients. Obviously, when you look at the continuum of treating peripheral arterial disease, uh, atherectomy allows you to treat patients with, with a no-stent strategy if you can get a, a stent-like result. But in those patients where you're committing to stents, uh, what's been limiting us is, is essentially the TLR rates uh, and the restenosis rates. And so what do we know about uh, restenosis or primary patency in these patients? If you look at this uh, chart, you see that um, obviously if you look at the mean lesion length and as you go towards the right, as the lesion length increases, there's a significant decrease in primary patency. Uh, so as the lesion length gets longer, uh, consistently through these trials, we see that uh, the patency goes down. The other thing that we also see is uh, the follow-up data between 12-month, 24-month, and 36-month. So the 12 being the dark blue, the 24-month uh, the being the light blue, and then the green uh, being the 36-month data. You see that there's a drop in primary patency also with the longer-term follow-up uh, consistently. Uh, so I, to you, I want to present durability too uh, today. Uh, which is uh, the, um, uh, the Everflex stent uh, platform. So this is a, a prospective multicenter non-randomized trial. It's a total of 287 subjects enrolled at 44 sites. 
the primary safety uh, was looking at major adverse uh, events at 30 days. Uh, and this was defined as clinically driven target lesion revascularization, so clinically driven TLR rates, amputation of the treated limb, or all-cause mortality. The effectiveness uh, was measured at primary stent patency at one year, uh, defined as binary duplex ultrasound ratio with the peak systolic velocity ratio less than two. Uh, at the stented target lesion, uh, no clinically driven uh, reintervention within the stented segment. So that was the safety uh, or the effectiveness. And then uh, clinical follow-up at 30 days, six months, one year, two year, and three years post-procedure. Uh, and what's uh, great about the study, even though it was non-randomized, was that there was an independent uh, clinical events committee, there was a, a data safety monitoring board, and core lab analysis uh, for the results. So let's look at the baseline lesion characteristics for this study. Uh, so if you look at this uh, baseline length, uh, 89.1 uh, millimeters out of this uh, 287 patients, uh, a total uh, occlusion uh, of 48 percent uh, and severe calcification in 43 percent. So you'll see that, and I'll compare this to other studies that we have, but you'll see that these are not uh, you know, simple, straightforward lesions. Uh, th these are uh, longer lesions. There's, there's a big, significant uh, majority of uh, almost 50 percent of total occlusions in the study and severe calcification of up to 40 percent. So what is the freedom from loss of primary patency? Uh, so looking at that uh, effectiveness criteria that I told you with the peak systolic velocity ratio less than two, uh, at 12 months you had a 77.9 percent uh, uh, primary patency rate, uh, and then at 24 months, 66.1 percent, and at uh, 36 months, 60 percent, and this is in almost 300 patients. Uh, by, let's split it up by lesion length. So if you looked at the actual lesion length, uh, uh, looking at the lesions less than 80 millimeters and the lesions greater than 80 millimeters, you see that there's a significant difference, obviously. Uh, as I showed you in the initial graph, as, as the lesion length increases, the patency decreases. Uh, so the one-year patency uh, uh, or freedom from loss of primary patency in the one year in, in the subset less than 80 millimeters of lesion length was 87.5 percent. That dropped down to 71 percent in three years. If it was greater than 80 percent, uh, you had a, a lesion length that was actually longer. So the mean lesion length uh, at, of 123 millimeters uh, you had a primary patency uh, rate of one year of 69.6 percent that dropped down uh, to three years of 50.5 percent. So nonetheless, uh, greater than 50 percent uh, freedom from loss of primary patency in this subgroup with the long lesion length. If you looked at the TLR rate, freedom from TLR, again looking at the two subgroups, uh, you had at three years in the lesion lengths that were less than 80, uh, you had an 80 percent uh, freedom from TLR. Uh, and in the greater than 80 arm, you had 61 percent freedom from TLR. So what about severe calcification and what is that impact on uh, patency rates? Uh, so if you look at the severe calcification uh, rate, what, severe calcification versus no severe calcification, you see that uh, the, at one year it's 85 percent uh, with severe calcification. And with not having severe calcification, the one-year patency rate or was 72.7 percent. So it was actually lower uh, in, the, in the subgroup that, had, uh, that didn't have a severe calcification. And the uh, breakdown on this is that the lesion length of uh, the patients with severe calcification was a lot longer than the patients without severe calcification. Um, but nonetheless, it's pretty impressive that despite the severe calcification, the patency rate was maintained. At three years, it was 67.3 percent um, in the severe calcification group. Let's look at stent fracture rate. Uh, we all know that this is important in, uh, in TLR and uh, uh, reinterventions in patients that do sustain uh, stent fractures. Uh, on the left, you'll see the classification of different stent fractures from class one through class five. And uh, class one are the single tine fractures to multiple tine fractures to fractures with displacement uh, to complete uh, dis uh, misalignment. And if you look at that, the fracture rates overall are extremely low. 0.4% at uh, one year, 
0.9% at uh, three years. And again, that's a follow-up of uh, 217 patients. So it's only two patients that had uh, overall stent fractures uh, in the entire subgroup. So uh, pretty impressive or impressively low uh, fracture rates. So the take-home points, uh, long-term follow-up data support, uh, continued safety and ef uh, efficacy of the Everflex stent platform. Uh, in these long, complex femoral popliteal lesions. So as I said, there were long lesions, there were total occlusions, there were calcified lesions, and the safety and efficacy is maintained uh, through three years. No major adverse events at 30 days, um, and acceptable events uh, rate through three years. Uh, so that's sustained, again, over 36-month follow-up. The primary patency rate at three years is 60% for the overall group. If you break it down between the shorter length and the longer length lesions, it's 71% and 51% uh, respectively. Uh, patients uh, with increased risk for poor outcomes, including severe calcification, uh, showed benefit uh, with good patency rates. Uh, in fact, it was better in the severe calcification subgroup. Uh, and excellent durability for the study with the fracture rate that was extremely low at three years at 0.9%. Uh, comparing it uh, across studies, um, if you look at the Durability 2 versus Resilient, which was the life stent, uh, the Zilva PTX, which is a drug-coated Zilver stent, and, uh, and a Stroll with the Smart stent. So if you look at it across the board comparison of these uh, studies, if you look at the calcification subset uh, in these different trials, you see that there was a much higher uh, percent of severe calcified patients or lesions in the Durability 2 study. If you look at the total occlusions, again, 48%, uh, markedly higher uh, than the other studies, and the lesion length uh, higher in this subgroup as well, with 89.1 millimeters uh, for total lesion length. Uh, if you look at the, the three-year freedom from uh, loss of patency uh, with the criteria that I mentioned earlier, Again, 71% in the uh, shorter lesion length group, which is comparable uh, to the other studies. Uh, with the Zilva PTX study, 68.7%. Uh, the freedom from TLR uh, in, these, in this shorter subset, again, the shorter lesions of less than 80 millimeters, uh, it's 80% compared to 84%, so comparable uh, in both of these groups at three, three years. Uh, you'll see that the stent fracture rate uh, on the other hand, is, is much lower uh, in this group. So at uh, three years, so is again, two events, two fr uh, stent fractures is 0.9% uh, compared to 4.1% in the resilient and 2.1% in the Zilver PTX. Uh, and with that, I'll conclude. Uh, we have some time uh, for questions, so thank you again for your attention. Thank you, John. We'll open up the floor for any questions you might have. I did want to make a couple of comments about the, um, the CLI with, uh, with Definitive LE. Um, my practice is almost entirely CLI, and I do a lot of blood and atherectomy. And the things that uh, actually were surprising to me about the Definitive LE data set was how well diabetics did. I mean, I'm, I live in Mississippi, so you're either diabetic or pre-diabetic. That are about the only two categories of patients we have. But um, the diabetics did surprisingly well with atherectomy, and I don't think in any other trial in really the history of cardiac medicine have we ever seen diabetics do just as well as diabetics in any intervention uh, in the vascular space, including a lima to the LED. Um, the other thing that I think stood out about the definitive LED data set is the patency in tibials. And I hear people say a lot that believe in uh, angioplasty below the knee that, you know, you don't really need patency, you just need wound healing. You just need the vessel to stay open long enough to heal the wound. Well, I'm not gonna argue with that other than to say that it'll stay open long enough to heal that wound, and maybe you can heal the patient out of that trial, but they're just gonna be enrolled in another trial next year when they recur. And so I think patency is important in tibials, and what I've seen in my patient population is that it's really true. It really, the definitive LE data is real. Um, when I see patients with multi-level disease and we do multi-level atherectomy, if they do have recurrence, and I take them back to the lab, it's usually the fempop segment that's restenosed and not the tibials. The tibials do really well. So those of you who are reluctant to go below the knee with the directional atherectomy, I would encourage you to do that, especially in your critical limb patients. Um, the small vessel turbo hawk has really revolutionized my practice. I use a lot of the SXC device. It has really expanded our ability to do real atherectomy 
below the knee, actually remove plaque from below the knee. Um, and these patients do really well. If you can establish straight line flow with a stent-like result, with no stents, um, these patients do really well. And the 95% limb salvage is real. It is real world, and that's what I see in my patients. You know, I think one of the other... Uh about this trial was the low incidence of adverse events. I think a lot of people shy away from uh, directional atherectomy because they're afraid of uh, adverse events, distal immobilization, and perforation. But this is a real world understanding of how rarely it does occur. And if you use meticulous technique and you, 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 know, you prepare uh, for, for any out, uh, adverse outcomes by putting in a distal protection device if you need it, I think your uh, incidence of adverse events is very, very low. I think a lot of people shy away from atherectomy due to that. The other issue is uh, you know, using atherectomy is in calcium, any kind of atherectomy. I don't care if it's directional, orbital, uh, rotational, I think using it in, in calcium is essential because if you don't and you angioplasty and stent, you end up with stent regret, which is a, a deformed stent with external compression from calcium. And then if that restenosis is trying to go in and, and trying to uh, uh, open that up again, it's just a disaster. So really it helps in terms of debulking that vessel and then doing adjunctive therapy with hopefully, you know, in the future we're going to have drug eluting balloons soon, uh, or if you want to put in a stent or a covered stent, whatever it is, but it really allows you to do subsequent uh, uh, interventions afterwards as well. Those are some great points, and I would reflect what you said about the uh, complication rate. You know, as an interventional radiologist or interventional cardiologist like myself, the last thing you want to have to do is call your friendly vascular surgeon to get you out of trouble. And if you look at the complication rate in definitive LE, in 800 limbs treated, only one patient went to surgery. So even the, the complications that did occur were able to be handled with endovascular techniques, and that's what I've seen in my patients, um, is that you can pretty much handle anything you get into with a prolonged balloon inflation um, or manual, manual pressure from outside with your hand um, to get these perforations to seal, but it is very rare. Even doing, I do directional arthrectomy all the way down into the pedal arch, and it is very rare to have to have a complication you can't handle in the cath lab thing that I see a reluctance is um, using atherectomy in CTOs, which I do. Prakash, what about you? Do you use uh, atherectomy in CTOs? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a learning curve to build up to that point, as you know, and I think uh, one of the things is, um, you know, the safety of the device and the technique that you follow it has to be meticulous uh, in CTOs especially, but uh, I think uh, it's not as dangerous as people think it is. Um, that's one. And secondly, I think the diabetic uh, thing that you alluded to, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, I remember in the early days when uh, Dr. Zeller's data came out and then um, uh, Jim McKinsey's first paper came out and, you know, the, everybody was shocked at this diabetic data. And, I, and we were seeing it in our own patients, I know, as you were. And one of the things that, that I was very, very gratified was that that held through in a large registry of 800 patients in multi-center with multiple, multiple people. So, you know, it, it, it's, the, the stents just don't do well in diabetics. Uh, we know that. And we know that you're also going to be burning bridges to future therapies, possibly. So I, if you can get away with, uh, with what John said, with, with a good, um, um, you know, result without having to stent, I think uh, it, it's very advantageous. Can I make a real quick comment about the CTO point? Because I think that uh, um, one little technique that revolutionized my practice about a year and a half ago is that the Hawk is a rear cutting device. And so you have to push the device through the area you want to treat and make sure it will cross before you ever turn it on. If you cross a long occlusion and then you push the device through the occlusion, which you need to do because you don't want to find out it won't cross when you have the blade engaged, and you pull it back, proximal occlusion, and then take a picture. You will have anagrade flow, and you're no longer treating an occlusion. You're treating a stenosis, and you can actually then choose deliberately which way to direct your blade at the proximal cap in the mid part of the occlusion, at the distal cap, and like I showed with the interior, direct, directing the blade toward the lumen for the subintimal space, and you can direct your blade where the disease is, not where the vessel wall is, and you can very safely do atherectomy in CTOs. I think uh, adding to everything else that was said, I think directional atherectomy is particularly beneficial in CTOs because uh, a lot of times when you're crossing these CTOs, you'll find that you're crossing either subintimally or you're crossing right next to the lumen on one side and all your plaque burden is on another. 
Uh, and so again, the advantage of uh, using directional atherectomy there is beneficial in multiple views to orient the cutter towards the plaque. Uh, the second comment I wanted to make is, again, for patency of uh, long lesions in the uh, SFA pop, uh, you know, the outflow is also important. I think a lot of times we don't talk about outflow and what the runoff is to the foot. And uh, early on, we used to believe that single vessel runoff is enough. But uh, if you're intervening on a long segment in the SFA and you have a single vessel runoff, the patency is going to be poor if your runoff is poor. So I think uh, we'll find that we're going to be a lot more aggressive treating the low knee disease for that reason. I have a question for you, John. I mean, with the durability data that you just presented, I mean, if you did have to stent, uh, would you choose a, uh, based on the data that you have, a long bare metal, um, you know, a, a protege stent versus uh, multiple silver stents? Yeah, I think uh, because of the data that we do have, we don't have the data for silver PTX and long lesions. So I think we do have data on long lesions with uh, for, the four-year data is out, but I know they have out to ten, and uh, you know, but not as as long as what you have now. So. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's interesting because as you can see, the, the, uh, the data sets, you can't compare across trials, and I think all of us who, who, who have done this long enough know that, but it gives you a, a hint to, to, to kind of help you make your decisions. Uh, the best data, obviously, is a randomized data, but here we have, we do have CoreLab adjudicated. You do have, you know, data safety monitoring board, and you have multiple operators, so this way you have as good a, a, a data set that you can at least uh, talk on. So what I was really interested in was that the fracture rates were so low, and and, uh, you know, and I was wondering whether you attribute that to the stent design, uh, the, the way the stent was deployed without stretch. What do you, do, what do you attribute that to? Um, you know, I think, I think the length of the stent does matter. I, I'd much rather use a single long stent than using uh, multiple overlapping stents. I think that plays a part in it. But uh, I don't think that's the reason for the low fracture rates here. I'm not sure what the reason is. It must be something in the design. Um, and especially with the percentage of uh, calcified lesions that you had in the subset, you would expect that the fracture rate would be higher, but it wasn't. Another um, use for the device, and um, I know it's a very off-label, probably a lot of us do it, it uh, using it within a stent. And, you know, uh, Covidian has definitely uh, brought us some great data with definitive LE, but I think we would really need to push a little bit further and start looking at atherectomy for incident restenosis, because I think there's definitely a use for it. And um, really, because angioplasty is not the answer for incident restenosis. I think we all know that. I think some type of debulking, whether it be laser or jet stream uh, or directional atherectomy, I think we really, that's going to be our next step, is really starting to look at directional atherectomy and putting together a clinical trial uh, with directional atherectomy for incident restenosis, I think would be important. I totally agree. I, I use it a lot um, for treating in stents that other people put in because I don't put many stents in. But um, the amount of plaque that you get out of those stents is remarkable. I mean, if you have a 200, 250 millimeter lesion that's been stented that's may not even occluded, even just to nose, it's not uncommon to fill up a long nose cone device four, five, six times. I mean, and I have a true handful of plaque at the end. Angioplasting that just does not work. There's just too much volume of plaque. Um, and so I t I'd agree with you. I think it is the way to do it. I'm hoping that we'll have some type of drug delivery in the future to treat these lesions that are stented, uh, either with a drug-cutted balloon or some type of drug infusion catheter like the bullfrog, um, to deliver drug into these vessels and prevent the instant restenosis. But I think debulking is absolutely mandatory. Well, um, Josh Vandenberg, and uh, I know you were at our conference just a month ago, and he presented his data from, uh, from with laser and ISR from uh, Switzerland, I believe. So there is some work being done on it. Obviously, it's single center work. I think Zeller also published his, uh, his um, atherectomy data with ISR as well. So, I mean, the, the, the point you're making is very true, is are we doing the right thing? Are we not? I mean, we had a lot of single center data with atherectomy. Now we have a large registry, 800 patients, where we can at least discuss in, a, in, a, in an objective manner what the findings were. So I think that's needed in this particular one. But the one thing is it's off-label, so it's very difficult for the sponsor to talk about that. And I would reflect something that was already mentioned, is if, you, if you're going to treat instant restenosis, I think it's also important to look at why the stents went down to start with. And we talked about that with the live case we did this morning. Um, is that what's the problem with this particular patient? And outflow runoff is an issue. 
And the nice thing about atherectomy is you can go and you clean out the stent and then you, you know, treat that discrete AT lesion or the TP trunk lesion that improves your outflow. We don't have great data on it yet, but I think it's coming. And we're going to have, uh, I think we're going to discover that the, the better your outflow, the higher your film pop segment patency is going to be no matter how you treat the film pop segment. But that's especially true if you use stent grafts. And I know that we talked a lot about Vibon this morning and the fact that maybe the failure rate isn't as high um, as what was expected. But I can tell you in my practice, I have a lot of people in my area that put in a lot of Vibons to single vessel runoff. And they do fail. And they, when they do go down, they go down in flames. And when I, when I treat those patients and get their vibons reopened, I go down and open their tibials. And a lot of times they'll stay open after that if you can improve their outflow. Any questions from the audience? All right, well, uh, I would like to thank our, uh, yes, go ahead. I think Dr. Walker is probably out enjoying himself right now. This <laughs> is Dr. Winscott. I'm flattered. But uh, uh, Craig may not agree. But uh, anyway, um, I think that uh, I do use it in the iliacs. Um, uh, I've used it in long segment iliac occlusions, uh, both retrograde and anagrade, and, uh, and used it in tear to get back into the lumen if I am subintimal, both in the common iliac and into the aorta if that's where you have to re-enter in patients with occluded distal aortas. Um, but yeah, I have used it in that situation. The nice thing about Viance is it's so versatile. You can introduce it through any 035 support catheter. I use a trailblazer. And so um, as I showed the case where I introduced it through the mid-thigh into the SFA, but I can also do that through um, pedal access. And I don't ever put sheaths into my retrograde access. I only use a support catheter through the skin. Um, I don't ever put sheaths in because I think I'm a radial operator a cardiologist and I think we know from radial uh, literature that the larger the, the catheter you put in the small vessel, the higher the occlusion rate is going to be. And so, I, you know, you're trying to open the tibial. The last thing I want to do is open the tibial so it can occlude where I accessed it. And so I put the smallest access I possibly can into the pedal. Um, so I, if I'm going to need to open up a film pop segment from a pedal access, I just use an 035 trailblazer through the skin and then introduce Viance through that. And then, because I'm only using the retrograde to cross, I treat, I always treat anagrade. Um, but yeah, it's very versatile. And then tear as well, is you can introduce through very small catheters. And so it's, it just puts a huge uh, toolbox into your, you know, tool into your toolbox to be able to treat from a variety of accesses um, with very effective catheters. And uh, adding to that again with the anterior device, it's the only re-entry device you can use below the knee. So you can't really take a Pioneer or six French device or an out back down below the knee. You can safely use a, an anterior and re-enter the true lumen for infra-pop revascularization. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And even going popliteal retrograde, you know, that's really expanded our options when we do SFA CTOs. We do a lot of SFA CTOs that are osteal SFA CTOs from a pedal access. And sometimes you get into the common femoral and you're subintimal. And so having the interior, that's really the only device that you can use retrograde small enough that will be able to go in and re-enter. And the way I am, the way I do things is, uh, is I want to make sure I know how to use that device because if I'm in a really difficult situation and I need to use it, I don't want it to be the first time I'm using it. So if I'm pedal access and retrograde, and I'm in common femoral subintimal plane, that should not be the first time I'm using an interior. So I think it's good to get used to the device, learn how to use it in an SFA, learn how to use it in a popliteal if you're subintimal, so that you're comfortable using the device. Just, because, just like any other device, you're gonna have a lot of a learning curve associated with it. So learn how to use the device so that if you're really in trouble, then you, you're very proficient with that device. And I'd again reflect the case I showed earlier where you know using directional atherectomy after re-entry. Um, I do that below the knee as well, and I showed a case this morning at the 9 o'clock talk where I used an anterior in the anterior tibial to re-enter distally, and then you know where you are in relation to the true lumen. And so then you just take your turbohawk down to that area, direct the blade away from the subintimal space and toward the lumen, and just you shave out the dissection flap. And oftentimes after, you, after atherectomy, you can't even tell where you re-entered. There's no flap there. I mean, it just is a beautiful stent-like result. So using directional atherectomy married with an interior entry catheter is a really great way to get stent-like results in these, in these vessels. 
there's uh, no other questions, we're going to go ahead and end up this uh, lunch symposium. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Winscott, and Dr. George for being here today. Thank you very much.